Welcome everybody to Keys to the Kingdom. I'm Marissa and uh, I hope you guys are having a wonderful Tuesday. Um, I just want to make sure that my sound and my I want to make sure my sound and my video are working before I start but um, today we're going to um, continue with our study of the book of Leviticus. We had stopped right in the middle and um, we wanted to continue that study so that we can um, understand what the laws of God were. You know, um, these were just laws for living, laws for the temple, um, laws for the priests. And um, we need to know what God's instructions were. What was Yah needing and asking of his people? Okay, so today we're actually going to be in Leviticus 16. Uh, 16 through 21 today. And I'm going to pull the scriptures up on the screen so that everybody can follow along in Leviticus. Um, <clears throat> and um, 16 through 21. So we're not yet. So, so we've got, so we've got today and then we'll do one more video next week and then we'll be done with Leviticus. So we'll do 16 through 21 today, and then next week we'll be doing, uh, we'll be finishing up the rest of Leviticus. And then we'll just keep moving right along into numbers. Um, and this Shabbat, coming up this Saturday, I'm going to be doing the um, part two video on the Lord is my shepherd. You don't want to miss this one. I really, really hope that you won't miss this Shabbat at 1130 and um, I promise you it's gonna be good I promise um, so this was gonna that's gonna be part two the Shabbat uh, on the Lord is my shepherd this is the study that we're doing um, on Psalm 23 from a shepherd's perspective and as I went through these next three chapter Three or four chapters um, in this book they were they were very beautiful so I hope that you'll be able to make it this Shabbat is everybody able to hear me okay I just want to make sure that everything's working properly if you could just comment below that everything sounds fine um, sometimes you never know what sort of technical difficulties are going to arise but my sound should be okay and um, then we'll go ahead and get into Leviticus 16 through 21. Looks like everything is working properly. And really quick, um, has everybody read Leviticus? Is there anybody watching that has not read Leviticus ever in their life. I'm curious. Um, you would be surprised. There's actually, th there's such a large percentage of people who have never read this book. They've never read the book of Leviticus. I would venture to say that most people have not, primarily because it's never taught in congregations. And secondly, because um, maybe perhaps they don't find it because it's not maybe as interesting to them as other books in the Bible. Maybe they just kind of gloss over it and they've never read it. Um, but uh, these are the laws of God. So I think it's important when particularly when people say God's law laws were done away with or Yeshua uh, nailed the laws to the cross, even though that's never mentioned in the Bible. They, they, they say that they teach this in, you know, Christian churches and stuff that the laws were done away with and, um, and that he nailed the laws to the cross, which is not what the Bible says. It says that he nailed our sins to the cross uh, which is very different. Um, but they say things like 
the law was done away with, but they don't even know what the laws were, what laws were given by Yah. And this is very troubling when you go back and you, and you read his laws. I don't see any laws within the Torah or in the book of Leviticus that, um, that are, um, needing to actually be done away with, um, as far as, I mean, they're all per, for our own good. And like I mentioned in the last Leviticus video, a lot of them pertained to the tabernacle that was in the wilderness and or the temple that was in Jerusalem. So the priestly services and laws pertaining to the temple, they don't need to be done away with. They're just, they just, they're just not applicable today because there is no temple. And you have to remember that in the temple and in the tabernacle, there was a physical manifestation. There was a physical presence this manifestation of, of Yah and his presence, okay? Some people refer to it as his Shekinah. Whatever terminology you wish to use, you have to remember that a lot of these laws had to do with being clean in the presence of this holy God. And as I've mentioned before, a lot of it has to do with um, the presence of God is this very, I say, f highly vibrating frequency only because I don't have any other words in the English language that I can really use because God is this, God is spirit. He's not flesh. So, he is energy. He is a type. He, he is the, he's the, the energy source of all source. He's the, the self-sustaining God, you know? So it is, there's so much power in him that to, to try to contain him in a tabernacle or a temple, God is giving laws to create an atmosphere in which a part of him may dwell with the children of Israel without them dying. It's, it's not like you can, you can't stand in, in the presence of God and live. There's too much sin nature within us. There's too much flesh. The, the two cannot coexist, which is why we are not dwelling with God now. It's, you know, it's not going to be until, you know, the last chapter of the book of Revelation that the Father and us are, are one again. And so in this process of restoration, and particularly in the book of Leviticus, um, a lot of these things are pertaining to God attempting and trying to create an atmosphere where he can dwell with his people without them dying. Because, you know, like it's like Moses. He, he wanted to see God face to face. He said, Moses, I, I can't show you my face, but I'm, I'll show you my back. Because if you look at me, if you look upon me, you'll die. So um, keep that in mind when, when, we, when we see all of these law, you know, a good portion of these laws. Um, it's none of them needed to be done away with. They, they just, a lot of them just don't apply today simply because we don't have a temple. We don't have a tabernacle. We don't have... There is no, um, the, um, there, there's no mercy seat, you know, there is no, um, reason for some of these to be used as of right now because of that reason. So, um, we're going to go through 16 through, tw like I said, we're going to go through six chapter 16 through 21 today. I'm going to bring the scriptures up on the screen so you can follow along. And then next week we will finish up with Leviticus and then we'll move on to numbers. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Um, let's see here. A 
Okay, so Leviticus chapter 16, verse 1. This chapter is titled The Day of Atonement um, because you're going to see here that it is pertaining to the Day of Atonement, uh, which is one of the... Well, actually, well, the Day of Atonement was actually considered the holiest day of the year for the children of Israel, um, being that this was the only day out of the entire year that the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies. And he would do this once a year to atone for the sins of Israel. Okay. And it says here, then Adonai, and Adonai just means Lord. Okay. I know some people um, don't like the word because it has some connection to a pagan god name, but, um, it just, it simply just means Lord. Um, and I'm just using this translation. You can use a translation that says Yahuwah. Um, this is just the one I'm using today. Good morning, Marissa. So glad you could make it, sweetie. And I'm glad everybody's able to hear me. Okay, then, I don't know, I spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Because Aaron's two sons had just offered um, <clears throat> strange fire. So basically, they offered an incense to God that was not prescribed in the duties of the priests. Again, it's not like God killed them. He didn't, he didn't kill them. They did something that was out of order in how you are to approach God's sanctuary. I mean, there, there is this, there is, the, there is a way that you are to, to, um, uh, approach God and come to God. I mean, again, this is not, you're, you're literally dealing with a physical manifestation presence of God of a piece of God dwelling amongst Israel and it can be very dangerous. It's not anything malicious. It's not like God had it out for Aaron's sons. It's not like he was trying to, you know, make himself look like this very vengeful. It had nothing to do with the venge, like a vengefulness of God. It's simply like you have to do things this way Otherwise, because God's presence is literally dwelling with Israel, you can die. It's like, it's like trying to deal with, um, lightning, okay? Or electricity. You're not going to stick your finger in a finger socket because why? You will probably get electrocuted. It's not like the electricity has it out for you or wants to kill you. It's just that, it's just that simple. Your flesh and electricity um, causes an electrical current to go through your body and you will be electrocuted. Now, if you stick your finger in a socket, you're not going to die. But if you get electrocuted by lightning, if you get struck by lightning, um, you could be severely injured or dead. Now, just imagine the presence of God, which is far stronger than any electricity or lightning could ever be. I just want to reiterate this because I don't want, I want people to understand that God wasn't, didn't kill or seek vengeance upon Aaron's children. He was specific in how he gave them instructions on how to approach them so that they wouldn't die. You know, it's like the guys that tried to catch the Ark of the Covenant from falling. It's not that God killed them. They simply died because they touched something that was so highly electrically charged that it just killed them because your flesh can't touch that. Okay. I just want to make that clear because a lot of people, particularly in, you know, atheists or unbelievers, they think that the God or even Christians believe that the God of the Old Testament was a vengeful, mean, wrathful, killing God. But that's not true. And so I want you to be equipped with the understanding that it was simply because they, they did things. It just happened. Okay. They, 
you know, Aaron's sons just, they, they decided to do something that God did not tell them to do. And God made it very clear that, you know, you have to do this in a prescribed way. Otherwise you could die because of this energy that's dwelling with you. Okay, let's get back to the scriptures. So he approaches Moses after the death of his two sons, of Aaron's sons, when they approached the presence of Yahuwah and they died. Katrina, so cool how this goes hand in hand with the post I was preparing. Thank you. Oh, wow. So that's interesting. I'll be curious to know what you were about to post. So chapter, uh, verse two says, Yuha said to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holiest place behind the curtain before the atonement cover, which the ark, which is on the ark so that he would not die. Okay. This is literally what I just said. It says, Yahuwah says to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place behind the curtain before the atonement cover so that he won't die. It's not God killing them. It's not God seeking vengeance on Aaron or his sons or Moses or anybody. It's just the simple fact that your flesh cannot stand in the presence of God God is trying to give you specific ways in which you can do that. But if you step outside of that protocol, you can die. It's very dangerous. You're dealing with a very, a very intense energy, frequency, electricity. These are the only words that I can use in the English language. I'm not trying to call God electricity or energy. I'm just saying that for our minds to sort of understand that God is spirit and it's 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 a very powerful force let's just say that it's a very powerful force that flesh cannot it does it, our flesh does not mingle with it and so God is trying to make a way for the children of Israel to be able to um, approach God so it says um so that he won't die, for I will be appearing in the cloud over the atonement cover. So God is planning to appear in a cloud over the atonement cover, but he says, don't just come at any time. Okay. And then it says, in this way should Aaron come into the sanctuary with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put it on the holy linen garment have the linen garments on his body, put on the linen sash, and wear the linen turban. They are the holy garments. He should bathe his body in water and put them on. I'm going to stop right here because I really, really want to point something out here. It is not any, it's not any habistance that linen was the chosen fabric for Aaron and his sons to wear. Linen actually has one of the highest frequencies, almost of anything, um, but certainly um, when it comes to fabric. Linen vibrates at a frequency of about 5,000 megahertz, okay? Whereas like fruits and vegetables and essential oils and stuff like that, they kind of vibrate anywhere from like 20 to like a hundred and some, you know, maybe 200. Whereas linen, which is made from flax, vibrates at a frequency at about 5,000 megahertz. Okay, so that in and of itself is important to point out. Um, when we do our study this Shabbat, um, as we continue on the Lord is my shepherd, um, I'm going to expound on, well, it's going to expound on why linen is the fabric of choice. There is another reason why linen was the fabric of choice. But these are the holy garments. And he's also to bathe his body in water. So you have water and you have him covering himself with linen. Then he is to take from the congregation of B'nai Israel two he goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So when you approach 
Yahuwah, you are to bring an offering. There's always an offering. Okay. Then Aaron is to offer the bull for the sin offering, which is for himself and to make atonement for himself and his house. Okay. Even the priest, the high priest had to bring a sin offering for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before Yahuwah at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Aaron will cast lots for the two goats. Okay, now I want you to realize that everything I'm reading right now has to do with the Day of Atonement. Okay, everything I'm reading has to do with the Day of Atonement. Okay, this is the one time a year that the high priest would go in and make atonement for the children of Israel. This is going to be something that the children of Israel are going to do every single year. Every single year. And we're about to get to the two goats. And I'm going to have to pause here and there because there's some things that I want to explain. Katrina says, posting a couple of national service announcements in regard to electrical lines underground and exposed non-guarded areas for parents to keep in consideration for some... Oh my gosh! Wow! Okay, so Katrina has to put out a public service announcement having to do with exposed electrical lines. Why? So that these kids during the summer don't get electrocuted. That is so interesting. I love how God just melds and confirms everything together. He's been doing that really quite frequently lately. Almost daily has God been doing that. Um, God is moving very, God is moving a lot, a lot right now. Yahuwah, Yah, Yah is moving a lot right now. Um, so just keep your eyes open. Um, he does move more, um, during certain times than other times. So just keep your eyes peeled because he's moving a lot right now. Um, thank you for sharing that Katrina. So I want you to see again, this is, this is the, this is what was supposed to be done during the day of atonement. These are not the regular offerings that we had read earlier on in Leviticus or the daily offerings. Um, this is the day of atonement. So it says, then he is to bring two goats and present them before Yah at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Aaron will then cast lots for the two goats. One lot is for Yah and the other lot is for the scapegoat. Okay. This is something that they did every day of atonement every year there was a goat cat there was cast lots one was for yah and the other was a scapegoat aaron is to present the goat on which the lot for yah fell and make it a sin offering so the lot that fell on the goat for yah is to become a sin offering but the goat upon which the lot for the scapegoat fell is to presented to be presented alive before Yah to make atonement upon it by sending it away as the scapegoat into the wilderness. So they would take this scapegoat and they would send it out into the wilderness alive. Also, Aaron is to present the bull of the sin offering which is for himself and so make atonement for himself in his house. He is to slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. Okay. He is to take a fire pan full of coals of fire from off the altar before Yah, plus two handfuls of sweet powdered incense and bring it within the curtain. So he's going to go and take a fire pan full of coals from the altar and two handfuls of sweet powdered incense and bring it within the curtain. Then he is to put the incense on the fire before Yah so that the cloud of the incense may cover the atonement cover that is on the ark so that he would not die. So he's going to go in there. Okay. He's going into behind the curtain. But this incense has to be covering the atonement cover. That's on the ark so that he won't die. 
Okay. Um, oh, hey, Crystal. Sorry, I didn't see you there. So glad you guys can make it today on a Tuesday. I'm actually off on Tuesdays, which is why I'm able to do this on Tuesday. So, so that he won't die. And then he's to take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the atonement cover. This is the bull that he's sacrificing for himself and his household. On the east side, okay? With his finger on the atonement cover on the east side. So that would be on the right. Before the atonement cover, he is to sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. You always see this, him sprinkling it seven times. Then he is to slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. So that's the one that the lot fell on the goat for Yah to be sacrificed, which is for the people of Israel. Okay. Bring its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the blood of the bull. So he's going to slaughter the goat for the people. He's going to go behind the curtain and he's going to put some of it on the east side just like we saw on the east. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, on the east side. And then he's going to sprinkle it with his finger seven times. Sprinkle it upon the atonement cover and before the atonement cover. So he is to make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of of B'nai Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which dwells with them in the midst of their impurities. See this? Which dwells with them in the midst of their impurities. God is trying to dwell. He's trying to, he's trying to make a way for him to dwell with a sinful people. Israel was full of sin. Okay? Israel was full of sin. They weren't a sinless nation. Never, never were they a sinless nation. However, they had entered into a covenant with Yah. They had agreed to this covenant with Yahuwah. So now he's trying, he's trying to dwell with them. He's trying to um, have this ability to be with his people. So verse 17 says, no one is to be in the tent of meeting when he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and he has made atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. Okay, so nobody can enter the tent of meeting until he comes out after making atonement for himself and his household and for all the assembly of Israel. Okay, there has to be a sacrifice. Then he is to go out to the altar that is before Yah and make atonement for it. So now he's going out to the altar. And he is to take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and dab it around the horns of the altar. He is to sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanliness of Israel. When he has finished atoning for the holy place the tent of meeting and the altar, then he is to present the live goat. Okay, so this is the scapegoat that we talked. This was the other, this is the second out of the two goats. Aaron is going to lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. He should place them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. Okay. Now listen to this. The goat will carry all their iniquities by itself into a solitary land. And he is to leave the goat in the wilderness. Okay. So one goat was for a sacrifice for the people of Israel. And the other goat, he was to place the sins upon this scapegoat and send it into the wilderness. Then Aaron is to come into the tent of meeting, take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place. Now, just so you know, the holy place is the holy of holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant is. 
That's where only the high priest can go. The tent of meeting is the other area outside of that, but within the tent, okay? And he's to leave them there. So he's got to take off his linen garments. He is to bathe himself with water in a holy place, put on his garments, and come out to offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people to make atonement for himself and for the people. So why is he bathing himself? Um, well, he's been messing with blood. He's had a bunch of, you know, he's been, he's been dabbling blood everywhere. Then he is to burn up fat of the sin offering in smoke on the altar. The man who leaves the goat as a scapegoat is to wash his clothes and bathe his body in water. Afterwards, he may come into the camp. So that's the guy who, um, who sent the scapegoat out. The bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, should be carried outside the camp and their hides, their flesh, their dung be burned with fire. So basically, you're just taking all the parts that you're not cooking and you're just burning them. Just like you would with, you know, if you were actually slaughtering an animal, you would take the part, you would slaughter it, you would take the parts that you're going to cook and then all the other parts that you don't eat, you're going to burn and discard of them. The one who burns them is to wash his clothes and bathe his body in water. Then afterwards he may come into the camp. This is to be a statute to you forever. Okay? Not until Yeshua comes. Not until the end of the age. This is to be a statute to you forever. That in the seventh month, because this is when we celebrate Yom Kippur, is in the seventh month, which are the fall feasts. Um, although some people would say, don't say fall feasts because it doesn't necessarily have to be in the fall, but okay. On the 10th day of the month. So every year on the 10th day of the seventh month, this is when we celebrate Yom Kippur or day of atonement. You are to afflict your souls and afflicting your souls is understood to be fasting. So for one day, which I don't think is too much to ask, one day of fasting, you're to afflict your souls and you're not to do any kind of work. Both the native born and the outsider dwelling among you. So you see here that in the 10th day of the seventh month, you're to fast. You're not to do any kind of work. And this is, this is the law for the native born Israel, Israel, Israelite, and also any outsider that is dwelling among you. For on this day, atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. From all your sins, you will be clean before Yah. It is a Shabbat of solemn rest to you, and you, to, you are to afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. The Kohen, who is anointed and who is consecrated to be Kohen, who is, Kohen means priest, in his father's place will make the atonement and put on the linen garments, the holy garments. He is to make atonement for the holy sanctuary, for the tent of meeting, for the altar, for the Kohanim, and for all the people of assembly. This will be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for Israel once in the year because of all their sins. It was done as Yah commanded Moses. Marissa says, does this include children? Yes. Yes, it does include children, uh, particularly if they were of age, um, you know, uh, to be able to do these things. Um, yeah. I mean, any children, any, any child could do it. Um, you know, I mean, some people say if I have a, uh, everybody participated. I mean, even if somebody was, you know, had a very, very young child, they would still be participating. Um, as far as the fasting, um, you know, today people will say if, if you have, you know, diabetes or you can't fast, um, 
you know, than to do a modified fast. Um, but, um, you know, that's just our modern way of doing it. We would, we would simply just not eat the entire day. And, um, uh, yes, you would, you would, you would try to include in, any child that is of age that can understand, um, or, or doesn't necessarily need to have, um, obviously if it's a baby and they're nursing or they have, uh, you know, they're on a bottle, then that would, that would not, that would not apply to them. In, in Hebrew culture, um, you're, you're not really considered, um, able to, you, you, you like today we have bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. Um, it's at that age, like 12 or 13, that you're able to make, um, basically you're, that you're held accountable for decisions that you make. So it may be that it was at that age that they really considered you as a child able to do it. Um, although... I would say even, even younger than 12 or 13, you could, they would probably be participating whether or not anybody younger than that was fasting. Um, probably in this day, I, I, I bet you they were <laughs> but today. Um, it's just whatever you can get your children to do probably. Okay. So chapter 17, uh, let's see here. 17. So place of sacrifice. So this says, Then Yah spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all of Israel and say to them, This is the word which Yah has commanded. Anyone from the house of Israel who slaughters a bull, a lamb, or a goat in the camp or outside the camp, but has not brought it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it as a sacrifice to Yah before the tabernacle, let blood guilt be charged to that man. He has shed blood. That man is to be cut off from among his people. Okay. So this is saying anyone who slaughters an animal outside of the camp. Um, but doesn't bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting. Is to be charged with shedding blood. And to be cut off from his people. Thus Israel may bring their sacrifices that they were making in the... So this is what it says. Thus Israel may bring their sacrifices that they were making in the open field to Yah. At the entrance of the tent of meeting to the priest. And offer them as sacrifices of fellowship offerings to Yah. So in other words, they're not supposed to just go out and slaughter these animals in their own accord and in their own way. Okay. They're supposed to be bringing them to the tent of meeting. And offering them as a sacrifice. The priest is to sprinkle the blood on the altar of Yah. At the entrance of the tent of meeting. And burn up the fat as a smoke. As smoke for a soothing aroma to Yah. They are no longer to offer their sacrifices. To the goat demons. After which they play the prostitute. This will be a statute forever to them throughout their generations. I'm going to pause here for a second. Because I just want to remind everybody that. Okay, just remember that Yah was not the only one that was um, requiring offerings and sacrifices. You have to remember that they just came out of Egypt. Those Egyptian gods all required sacrifices. People were sacrificing um, many things during that time to, hey, Jessica, glad you can make it, sweetie. People were offering um, sacrifices to many, many gods in whichever way they seemed fit. Uh, a lot of them offered their children as sacrifices. And God is, Yah is trying to distinguish how he wants a sacrifice brought to him. Versus how those, how those of the nations were sacrificing to, to pagan gods, to, to the fallen angels, okay? Because remember, 
we dealt with in Genesis about these fallen angels who created Nephilim by mating with humans. These are the gods of old. These are the gods that Egypt was worshipping. These are the gods that they were worshipping in Babylon, that they worshipped all throughout history. These are, the, these are the false gods. But they also sacrificed to these gods. And Yah is distinguishing how to sacrifice to him and how, you know, versus how they were sacrificing to these other gods. And he says here, no, no, don't go out there and sacrifice your own animals like you were sacrificing to these goat demons. Okay. Um, which is interesting. So goat demons. Well, we know if you study, um, if you've ever studied, let me see if I can bring up a picture for you. Um, his name is Pan. Okay. And he's a goat god. His name was Pan. Okay. This is in Greek mythology. He's the god of the wild shepherds and flocks. You usually see him playing a flute. But he is depicted as a goat. But he's half goat and he's half man. And I believe that he is the goat demon that, that they're referring, that God is, Yah is referring to in the scripture here. Because, let me see if you can see. Okay, no. Um... Let me see if I can bring up a picture. I'm going to bring up a picture because I want you to understand that these demons were the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Because remember, they were mixing people and animals together. This is why you hear of, you know, the half, the centurion, the, not the centurion, the, um, the half man, half horse, the centurion is in, is a Roman, um, the half man, half horse, or mermaids, or Pan, who is half man, half goat. Um, let me see if I can bring up a picture for you. Because this is the God that they were sacrificing to. And this is who God is telling them, no, no, no. You're not going to sacrifice to me like you were this, this goat god or this goat demon. Well, it's because, because remember, the fallen angels were considered the gods when they mated with Nephilim and the Nephilim died. Or when, when they created these half human, half animal beings and they were killed, their spirits or their souls, they don't really have a, they have something, there's some sort of a soul, but maybe not a spirit. Uh, they were disembodied, so they were roaming the earth, terrorizing, you know, people. Let's see here. Okay. Um, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't want to cause any... I don't think I'm going to be able to download it and show it here, but, um, just look up Pan, P-A-N. He's half ho half goat, half human. And, um, this is, I believe this is the demon God that they were, um, sacrificing to. And he says here, you're not going to, you're not going to sacrifice to me like you were sacrificing to him. So it says... They are no longer to offer their sacrifices to the goat demons after which they played the prostitute. This will be a statute forever to them throughout their generations. Then you are to say to them, anyone from the house of Israel or from the outsiders dwelling with them who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice but does not bring it to the tent of meeting to sacrifice it to Yah is to be cut off from his people. So Yah has a reason for doing this because... There was lots of sacrifices going on to other gods and demon gods, you name it, okay? The world was saturated in paganism. So God is trying to create a people of his own that do not, work, do not worship the way that the nations worship. 
And they don't worship the gods that the nations worship either. And they don't sacrifice the way that the nations sacrifice to their gods. Um, remember, Yah says, you are not to worship me and serve me like the nations do to their gods. Okay? I am not the same as they. So then it goes on to say, so laws against eating blood. This is very important. And there is a reason why God had to say and make laws for not eating blood. Okay? Why do you think God, Yah, would have to make laws against eating blood? Well, simply because there were people who were consuming blood. They, um, and I know some of you, maybe not all of you, I know some of you know what I'm talking about when I say that there are some people today who are accused of drinking blood, even to this day, and that they're doing it so that they can um, stay youthful and they can um, live longer and that they will have energy and vitality and mental clarity. Um, never mind that it makes them a psychopath, um, but this is why they do it. But supposedly um, people in very, very high positions of power consume blood today. And a lot of people accuse, um, accuse, um, the queen and, um, a lot of the, uh, the monarchy of consuming blood and drinking blood. Has anyone here heard of, um, hold on one second. The name has just left me. Has anyone here heard of... Gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Basically, and cover your ears if, you're, if it's too sensitive for you, but basically, <clears throat> there's this theory that a lot of people in positions of power... Um, you know, there's a lot of child child trafficking going on today. It's been going on for a long time. And this breaks my heart to say it, but I'm just letting you know. Um, that they put these children, they kidnap these children. They put them in very, very, very high stress situations with torture. Uh, because it does something to their blood. They have to be at a very young age. Young. I mean, like from five to eight or younger. Um, via torture methods, it increases... Um, Crystal knows what I'm talking about. Adrenochrome. Thank you. Uh, the, sometimes I have a problem with words. Adrenochrome. Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Thank you. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Most everybody. Uh, adrenochrome is, is this, so it's the blood of these children after they've been tortured and this, their adrenaline has been at such a high peak and then they use this blood, um, today. She said it's real, very real. Yeah. So this adrenochrome, this, look, there's nothing new under the sun. What has been done is being done today. What's being done today is what they were doing back then. And this is what God is talking about in these next chapters when he's making laws on not drinking blood. And it's not just drinking blood of humans. It's also of animals. You are supposed to uh, slaughter animals in a way that, you know, their, their blood would run out. And you weren't supposed to drink the blood of animals. So God is making laws on why not to do this. And I can't for the life of me figure out why anybody would go back through this, read these laws, other than the fact that they just don't understand them 
They just don't have a full understanding of why God had to make these laws and say that they need to be done away with. I mean, why would you have to do away with them? Why do you need to do away with not drinking blood? Yes, that's right, Crystal. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns. And I promise you, he is at the door. He is at the door. Okay, so the laws for not drinking blood. Anyone from the house of Israel or any outsiders dwelling among them who eats any kind of blood, I will set my face against that soul. The one who eats blood and the one who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the creature is in the blood and I have given it to and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your lives. For it is the blood that makes atonement because of the life. This is why there has to be the shedding of blood to atone for sin. He says, I've given it to you to make atonement for sin. I have not given it to you to consume in your body. Because the life, everything, the life, the DNA is in the blood. Okay, go and study what's in the blood and you'll understand why the life is in the blood. Therefore, I have said to Israel, no person among you may eat blood, nor may any outsider dwelling among you eat blood. Any person from Israel or from the outsiders dwelling among them who hunts as game any animal or bird that may be eaten must drain its blood and cover it with dust. For the life of every creature is, its blood is in its life. Therefore I said to Israel, you are not to eat the blood of any kind of creature. For the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it is to be cut off. Everyone who eats what dies naturally or is torn by animals, whether he is native born or a foreigner, is to wash his clothes and bathe himself in water. He is to be unclean until evening. Then he will be clean. But if he does not wash them or bathe his body, then he will bear his iniquity. So what he's saying here in this last part is that um, if something dies naturally, see, typically today, you're, you're not supposed to eat roadkill or something that dies of natural causes or is torn by animals. Um... Because it makes you unclean. But he's telling you here that, you know, don't eat roadkill. Otherwise, it's going to make you unclean until evening and you're going to have to bathe yourself. Okay. All right. Chapter 18. Chapter 18 is unlawful sexual relations. These are the laws uh, that are good. I mean, why would anybody say that Yeshua did away with these laws? I mean... Don't we need to keep these laws today? Hold on one second, guys. Yeah. I mean, is there anything about these laws so far that seem like they needed to be done away with? That Yeshua needed to do away with? I don't think so. We're not eating blood today. We, they weren't eating blood then. Um, and all of these unlawful sexual relationships... I surely hope they apply to Christians. I hope that they think that they apply to them. But the problem is, is they've never read Leviticus. So they don't even know what laws they're talking about when they say that the laws were done away with. They don't even know. Um, I'm just trying to um, prepare you when you're in a conversation with somebody and they say the law is done away with. Just ask them. Just say, so which laws do you have a problem with? Can you just point me to one law that you're not in favor of us doing? Please. And I guarantee you, none of them have read Leviticus. None of them have read Leviticus. And if they read it, they certainly didn't understand it. And they don't have any clue of what they're reading. I hope they're not drinking blood. I hope they're not having sex with their mother or father. Okay, so verse 1 says, 
Yah said to Moses, speak to Israel and say to them, I am Yah, your God. You are not to act as they do in the land of Egypt, where you used to live. Nor are you to act as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you to. Nor are you to walk in their customs. Okay? Remember this. You're not to walk in their customs. God is trying to create a people who are set apart. There's a reason why he says my set apart people, my holy treasure, my treasured possession. I want you to be different from the world. I don't like the way they do the things that they do. I don't like how they worship other gods. I don't like the laws that they keep. I'm giving you, I am creating a people who I want to be holy for I am holy. Okay. You are to obey my ordinances and keep my statutes and walk in, in them. I am Yah, your God. So you are to keep my statutes and my ordinances. The one who does them will live by them. I am Yah. So you do my laws and you'll live by them. That's all his laws were about. It was just about living a normal, happy, prosperous, clean life. That's all they are. It's not like these laws were like heavy. They weren't a heavy yoke. None of God's laws were burdensome. None. The only laws that Yeshua came against were the laws that the Pharisees and the political system, the rabbinical system had made during his time. They had created all these extra laws that had n no that had no foundation in the laws that God gave. Okay? No. Crystal said not hard to live by. They're not hard to live by. I don't have any problem not drinking blood and not sleeping with my father. I mean, not not a problem but for me at all. Um Again, I'm just I'm just trying to prepare you when you have conversations with people who say the laws were done away with, the laws were a yoke. See what it says in Galatians, it's coming against the law. No. The problem during Yeshua's time were all the extra laws that were created around God's laws for people to keep. Those were burdensome. Those were laws that were man-made laws and traditions, not God's laws and God's ways. Can't eat roadkill. Oh, darn. Dripping sarcasm. <laughs> I know, right? It's like, oh, man, that armadillo that got ran over by a car. I was looking to cook him up and eat him good. I mean, come on, people. What are we missing out on? Am I missing out on anything? Is there anything that's burdensome in these laws? I don't think so. But you can imagine whatever you want when you haven't read Leviticus. Christians can imagine all these terrible things about the law when they've never read Leviticus and all they do is read Galatians, which isn't even talking about God's laws. It's talking about the man-made laws that the Pharisees were putting on people and yoking people with. Anywho, back to God's laws. Here we go. So it says, you are to keep my statutes and my ordinances. The one who does them will live by them. Okay? He just wants you to live a happy life. Happy, clean, healthy life. None of you is to come near anyone who, are, who is his close relatives to uncover their nakedness. I am Yah. Oh, darn. I can't have sex with my cousin. Shucks. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I certainly hope that Christians aren't allowed to do this today. You are not to uncover the nakedness of your father or your mother. She is your mother. You should not uncover her nakedness. Seems pretty reasonable to me. You're not to uncover the nakedness of your father's wife, for it is your father's nakedness. You're not, so your step, so your father's wife could be your mom or a stepmom. You know, maybe your mom died and now there's a new mom. You know, can't sleep with her. Sorry. You are not to uncover the nakedness of your sister. Oh, shucks. All those monarchs in Europe who were keeping it in the family were definitely against God's law. But yet they were proclaiming Christianity and yet they were marrying their sisters and brothers. 
Not cool. So not your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother, whether born at home or elsewhere. You're not to uncover the nakedness of your son's daughter or of your daughter's daughter, for theirs is their own nakedness. You're not to uncover the nakedness of the daughter of your father's wife, conceived by your father, since she is your sister. You're not to uncover the nakedness of your father's sister, for she is your father's direct relative. So you can't sleep with your aunt, okay? Or your uncle. I hate to break it to you. You're not to uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, for she is your mother's direct re relative. You're not to uncover the nakedness of your father's brother by approaching his wife, for she is your aunt. You're not to uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law, for she's your son's wife. You're not to uncover her nakedness. You're not to uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife because he's your brother's nakedness. You're not to uncover the nakedness of both a woman and her daughter. You're not to take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness for they are direct relatives. This is wickedness. You're not to marry your wife's sister to be a rival uncovering her nakedness while her sister is alive. You're not to approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she's in her impurity of her nida. So basically, you're not to have sex with a woman who's on her period. Okay? Um, don't know why you'd want to do that anyway. But, you know, apparently some people think God's laws are terrible. You're not to lie sexually with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. You're not to give any of your children in sacrifice to Molech and defile the name of your God for I am Yah. Um, yeah, God doesn't want you sacrificing your child to other gods. In fact, he doesn't want you sacrificing your children to him. Um, I, I hope, I hope that the Christian community thinks that, that that's, that's okay. I hope that they don't, I hope they're not sacrificing their children. Oh gosh, I certainly hope not. But you see here, these are all common sense. Like, we haven't run across any laws that are like, oh, I have to do that. Like, none of them are burdensome. None of God's laws were, you know, not common sense. And it's not even already, most of these are already things that we already do. But yet and still... Christians want to teach, pastors want to teach that he did away with, he did away with God's laws, um, with whatever exception or few that they want to say Yeshua said to keep. Sad we made Yah actually have to spell this out for us. Right. Yeah, well, he had to spell it out for them during this time because they were coming out of Egypt. They were, I mean, the, the whole earth was saturated in pagan idolatry. Everybody was sac sacrificing their kids. Everybody was, pretty much everybody was drinking blood. Everybody was involved with witchcraft. Everybody else was serving other gods. So here in this time, he had to spell it out for them, but he shouldn't have to spell it out for us today. I don't think, I mean, again, again, they teach these things, but they don't read Leviticus. So, if anyone says to you, God did away, Yeshua, you know, did away with the law, please ask them, which law did he do away with? Ask them. It's just that simple. It'll get them thinking. If you ask questions, it gets people to think. Say, so which laws did he do away with? Please point me to one that you don't like. Okay, so, yeah, can't, can't give your children to sacrifice to Molech, which is, you know, a false god. Um, you know, can't do it. You're not to lie with a man as with a woman. That is an abomination. So, you cannot have sex with the same sex. That's an abomination. I hate to break it to you. It's not my opinion um you're not to lie with the same sex you are not to have sex with the person of the same sex as you would the opposite sex and that's just how god created things 
You're not to lie with any animal to defile yourself with it, nor is any woman to give herself to an animal to lie down with it. That is a perversion. I'm sorry, you're not allowed to sleep with animals. Bestiality and homosexuality are not God's creation. Uh, not my opinion. It's just the way things go. If you, if someone says to you, um, that's not what the Bible says. It's not, it, it doesn't say that you, uh, there's not, homosexuality is not in the Bible. First of all, they haven't read the whole Bible. Um, secondly, once you open that door, to, because you see how these, these verses are right next to each other. First it says, not lying with um, a woman as you would a man. So you're not going to sleep with a man like you would a woman. Um, and that includes women too. Some people will argue that women are allowed to sleep with women because it doesn't say specifically women can't sleep like you would sleep with a woman. Um, just go into the, fast forward to the New Testament and Paul mentions women sleeping with women. Okay, these laws, when they were given, listen, it was a, it was a, it was a patriarchal society. God is speaking to men because he's speaking to the priests. So the women were not, you know, um, you know, he's speaking to Aaron and his sons and stuff. So, um, but people will say, um, no, the, the Bible doesn't talk about homosexuality. That's not what it means. Once you open that door. Once now, now that society has opened that door and they're actually making laws where you can marry someone of the same sex, these are the laws of the land now, uh, bestiality is going to come right behind it. Now people, and, well, I mean, there are people who already do it, I'm sure. Um, but that's what's next. You've opened that door and now people are going to, uh, be able to sleep with animals. Okay. Because now you've opened Pandora's box. Now anything is, um, now anything's allowable. <clears throat> so you can't sleep with an animal. It's a perversion. Do not defile yourselves in any of these things. For all of these ways, the nation... For in all these ways, the nations which I am casting you out before you were defiled... So, again, God is trying to create a people who do not act as the world acts because they do these things. This is why he's having to tell them his laws because the whole world is lawless at this point. You know, it wasn't long after Noah in the flood that... Um, Noah's children and, and their descendants started going, started worshiping false gods again. It wasn't long. It didn't take very long for them, for the whole world to become completely defiled right after the flood. It's, 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 it's pretty amazing actually how quickly. But um, he says, don't do these things. Because these are the ways, these are all, it's in all these ways that the nations which I am casting out before you were defiled. The land has become defiled, so I will punish its iniquity, and the land will vomit out its inhabitants. I don't care what people it was. You will see throughout all of history, every society that has debased itself in these practices eventually were no more. They were allowed for a time and a season, and then God um, would end up wiping these people out. The land will vomit out its inhabitants. You, however, are to keep my statues, my ordinances, and do none of these abominations, neither the native born or the outsider dwelling among you. So you see this outsider dwelling among you, even if you aren't native born, because people like to say, oh my gosh, those laws are only for Jews. Those laws are only for Israel. Um, sorry. But if you are grafted into Israel, which the book of Romans talks about, then you are part of this commonwealth of Israel. And you are, you know, whatever you want to consider yourself. The outsider dwelling among Israel. Then these laws apply to you too. You're not allowed to sleep with animals or your dad or your mother either. Okay. 
for all these abominations were done by the men of the land who were before you, and the land became defiled. If you defile it, the land will vomit you out, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. God is not partial. God, God is not partial. He does not pick and choose. You know, he doesn't show favoritism. The only favoritism he shows are those who are obedient to him, who are just, you know, following his ways. It's, it's really simple. And somehow it's been made complex and complicated and it's not. It's very simple. God is just saying, you know, you know, I'm taking them out and I'm bringing you into this land because of all the, the disgusting practices that they're practicing. But make no doubt, you know, make no mistake about it. If you start doing these things, I'm vomiting you out too. God is not partial. Okay. He does not play favoritism. He just wants obedience. There's nothing wrong with obedience. For whoever does any of these detestable things, the souls that do them are to be cut off from the midst of their people. Therefore, you are to keep my charge so that you do not practice any of these detestable customs that were practiced before you so that you do not defile yourselves by them. I am Yah, your God. That, that simple. Don't defile yourselves with these practices. Okay, chapter 19. Let's see what this is. All right, so this says the Lord is holy. The Lord is holy. So it says, Yah spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of Israel and tell them, You shall be a Kedoshim. Do you know what that word Kedoshim means? A holy people. For I, Yah, your God, am holy. You're to be holy, for I am holy. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're talking about, Tiffany. R, G, H, G, R. Mm. <laughs> I'm not sure what she said either. She might be trying to abbreviate something, but I'm not really sure what it is. God says you're to be a holy people, for I, your God, am holy. He just wants you to be like him. That's all. Each one of you is to respect his mother and his father and keep my Shabbat. So all my Sabbaths, okay? Oh, that's so funny. Sweet baby got the phone. <laughs> My children, that's funny. <laughs> Each one of you is to respect his father and his mother and keep my Sabbaths. So all of my, uh, my holy feast days, my appointed days. I am Yah, your God. Do not turn to idols or make molten gods for yourself. I am Yah, your God. When you bring a sacrifice of fellowship offerings to Yah, you are to offer it so that you may be accepted. It is to be eaten the same day you offer it, and the next day. But if anything remains until the third day, it is to be burnt with fire. If it is eaten on the third day, it is disgusting. It will not be accepted. Rather, anyone who eats it will bear his iniquity, since he has profaned what is holy to Yah, and that soul will be cut off from his people. He's saying, um, don't eat old leftovers. That's basically what he's saying. Don't eat old leftovers, because now you're going to be unclean. Again, remember, you have to put yourself back in the time that this was written. They did not have refrigerators. They did not have freezers. They didn't have all of the proper storage of food that we do today. So you had to eat your food right away. You know, you weren't saving leftovers. It could make you sick. This is all God's saying. He's saying, don't eat old food. It will make you unclean. Look at this. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, I'm just going to pause this for a second. So, wait a minute. Doesn't churchanity teach that the Messiah is the only one who said to love your neighbor as yourself? 
but he did away with all of God's God's laws, you know. But he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Yeshua didn't make up anything new. Nothing he said was new. It all came from the Torah. He was literally quoting from what was already written. Anytime they came to Yeshua and tried to trick him, he says, it is written. It is written. It is written. He didn't say anything new. He didn't create any new laws. Nothing he said was made up of his own accord. He only, he said, remember what he said? He said, I only do what I see my father do. And his father wasn't doing anything new either. He had always taught to love your, these laws were, these laws were to protect me from me and me from you and you from me. So here we see loving your neighbor as yourself. Okay. And that's what these laws are pertaining to. When you reap the harvest of your land, you're not to reap to the very corners of your field, nor are you to gather the gleanings of your harvest. You're not to pick the remnants of your vineyard, nor are you to gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. Instead, you are to leave them for the poor and for the outsider. I am Yah, your God. God is literally telling them not to gather the corners of their field or anything that falls. You know, when you're harvesting, there's lots of crop that's going to be left over. He's saying, leave it there. I'm giving this to the poor, the people who don't have any food. God is taking care of the poor here. He's looking out for these people. This is not, this, nothing Yeshua taught was new. Nothing about the new covenant is new. It's just true. In the words of Brad Scott, God rest his soul. Love that man. What an amazing anointed teacher. He always said that. He said, it's not new. Nothing in the New Testament is new. It's just true. But you don't know that unless you go and study the Torah. Okay. So this is for the outsider. You are not to steal. You are not to lie. You're not to deceive one another. See how he's creating laws just to protect us from each other? You're not to swear by my name falsely. And so to profane the name of your God, I am Yah. You're not to oppress your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of a hired servant are not to remain with you all night until morning. See, you were supposed to pay someone their day's wages on the same day. You were not supposed to pay them the next day. You were not supposed to hold back their, their pay until the next day. This is so that they could go buy food. This is so that, you know, they worked for it. You know, they shouldn't have to wait for their wages. You're not to curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind. But you shall fear, fear your God, I am Yah. You are, not to do, you are to do no injustice in judgment. You're not to be partial towards the poor, nor sure favoritism towards the great. But you are to judge your neighbor with fairness. You're not to go up and down as a talebearer among your people. You're not to endanger the life of your neighbor, I am Yah. In other words, you're not a, you can't go around spreading tales that aren't true. You are not to hate your brother in your heart. Instead, you are to firmly rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Again, this is everything Yeshua taught. This is nothing new that he taught. Not to hate your brother in your heart. You are not to take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. What do you know? It says, love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yah. You shall keep my statutes. You must keep my statutes. You are not to crossbreed different kinds of animals. Oh my gosh. Is God telling them not to hybridize animals? Huh. Wonder why he would have to give that law. You're not to crossbreed different kinds of animals. Gee, is that because people were doing that or trying to do that? 
Is that because that's what the fallen angels and the Nephilim were doing? And that's why God, Yah, had to flood the whole earth because they had tainted even the animal kingdom by crossbreeding them? Oh, if people would just read Leviticus, there's so much here. Don't crossbreed different kinds of animals. You're not to sow your field with two kinds of seed. Nor are you to wear a garment woven of two kinds of material. There's a reason for this. There's a reason um, when you sow two kinds of seed. Um, and by the way, this is also speaking to, um, you know, crossbreeding seeds together as well. Uh, or genetically modifying seeds as well. Not to wear a garment woven of two kinds of material. There's a reason for that. Because there is a frequency in material. Okay. And when you mix them together, it, it can cancel out that frequency and possibly bring it to a level that it causes harm to your body. If a man lies sexually with a woman who is a slave girl, pledged to be married to another man, but not ransomed or given her freedom, they are both to be punished. But they are not to be put to death because she was not free. Okay, so basically, you can't sleep with your slave girl who is pledged to be married to another man. Um, just because she's not free yet doesn't give you the right to sleep with her. He is to bring his trespass offering to Yah to the entrance of the tent of meeting, a ram for a guilt offering. The Kohen is to make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering. See that trespass offering? Because he was trespassing on another woman. Before Yah for his sin that he committed, and the sin that he committed will be forgiven him. When you come to the land and have planted all kinds of trees for food, you are to consider their fruit as forbidden. Three years it will be forbidden for you. It is not to be eaten. So basically, um, when you plant trees for food, um, you have to wait three years before you can eat the fruit. Okay? These are the laws having to do with the... The fruit trees, the fruit bearing trees. In the fourth year, all its fruit will be holy for giving praise to Yah. In the fifth year, you may eat its fruit. So it will yield its increase to you. Basically, he's telling you how tr fruit, tr fruit trees work and how you will get an increase and an abundance out of it by not eating it in the first three years and waiting until the fifth year. Okay. So it will yield its increase to you. I am Yah your God. You are not. Okay, so I am Yah your God. You're not to eat any meat with the blood still in it. Nor are you to use enchantments or practice sorcery. Okay, again, these are very useful, practical laws that I don't have any problem with. You're not to round off the hair on the sides of your head. Nor are you to mar the edges of your beard. Um, what he's speaking to here has to do with a, pra a pagan practice of um, something that they would do um, with their hair. This is what he's this is what he's speaking of. You're not to make any cuttings on your flesh for the dead, or make any tattoo marks upon yourself. Yeah, I mean, these were these were pagan practices. They would cut their flesh. And they would also tattoo themselves as well. Um, God did not want his people marking their bodies. That's all I have to say about that. Do not defile your daughter to make her a prostitute so that the land does not fall into prostitution and become full of wickedness. Okay? Don't, don't pimp out your daughter. Okay? You are to keep my Sabbaths. And reverence my sanctuary. I am Yah. Okay. Do not turn to those who are mediums or soothsayers. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am Yah your God. What if we already have tattoos? That, ta that same thing falls in line with, you know, you know, 
anything else that we've done outside of being in covenant with Yah that we've done out I mean all of us have committed something against all of us have transgressed the law mostly prior to coming to walking and coming into covenant with Yah so if you already have a tattoo that was something that was done uh, more than likely prior to your understanding of coming into covenant with Yah and what his laws were. So obviously that would be up to, that would not, that would not be a practice that you would continue to practice after coming into covenant with Yahuwah and knowing his laws. Um, you just, you know, it's the same thing that you would do. Yeah. Crystal says repent for it. So, you know, it's the same thing as with any other law that, that we have committed outside of or before coming into covenant with Yahuwah. You know, um, some people have them removed. Um, that, you know, so you just, you need to, um, you need to get with Yah about that. But yeah, obviously repenting for it, not adding more tattoos. Some people have the tattoos removed. Um, there is something that is done to the body um, by having ink in your body. I don't remember the science behind it. I know that there is some sort of uh, um, harm that it can cause, but um, I don't have the, the study right in front of me. There's a whole study on why you shouldn't tattoo, but... But again, it's just um, all of us have done things prior to coming into covenant with Yahuwah. Um, you are to rise up in the presence of the gray haired and honor the presence of the elderly. So you will fear your God. I am Yah. So that is so beautiful. That's just saying you're, you're, to, you're to respect your elders. These are people who have lived longer than you. They know more than you. They're wiser than you. And they have been through more than likely more than you have. And so God, and in 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 His society, you're to honor the gray-headed. You're to honor the elderly. Okay, um, where it, it's not supposed to be how it is today in America, which is horrible. You know, we just we we put the the, the elderly to the side. We push them to the side, and um, it's just it's just very sad. You know, people, you know, all these people that are in nursing homes. It's just really sad. I mean, these these elderly people are supposed to be, I mean, unless they're just, you know, completely outside of God and or anything that's right, um, they have a lot to offer. And you were supposed to honor the elderly. If an outsider dwells with you in your land, you should do him no wrong. Not supposed to do him any wrong. The outsider dwelling among you should be to you as a native born among you. You should love him as yourself. For you dwelled as an outsider in the land of Egypt. I am Yah your God. So you don't treat outsiders. Listen, some people use this verse to say that we're supposed to treat illegal aliens the same. Obviously. Like, like they use this. Um, law that's been done away with, uh, supposedly, to say that this is why we should allow illegal aliens to come into our country here in the, the, the States. Um, this is not the same thing. Obviously, you're not supposed to murder them and you're still supposed to treat them with respect, but it's th that's not the same thing as what's happening here. What God is saying is that you are supposed, all of his laws are to apply the same within his covenant. If anyone is coming outside and wishes to follow his ways, you're to treat them the same. You're not supposed to treat them as an outsider. Okay, and then right here at the end, it says, um, you must not be dishonest in judgment, in measurements of length, weight, or quantity. You are to have honest balances, honest weights, honest bushel measures, and honest gallon. In other words, don't fudge it, okay? Don't say, um, you know, that you weighed out 
you know, a tenth of an effa for somebody when it's actually a fifth of an effa for somebody and they're paying you for a tenth of an effa. That's not right. Um, I am Yah your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You must observe all my statutes and all my ordinances. Do them. I am Yah. Okay. Chapter 20. Punishment for child sacrifice. Seems reasonable to me. Um, I think child sacrifice should be punished. Moreover, you are to tell Israel, anyone from B'nai Israel or from the outsider dwelling in Israel, who gives any of his children to Molech should surely be put to death. The people of the land are to stone him with rocks. I also will set my, fe my face against such a person and will cut him off from among his people. Because he has given his children to Molech, defiling my sanctuary and profaning my holy name. I want you to notice something here. I want to point out. You hear this a lot. Again, particularly in church, churchianity. Um, that um, all sins are the same. We've all sinned. Um, sin is sin. Um, they'll say things like, you know, all sins are not equal, okay? You murdering somebody is not the same as you lying to somebody. This is preposterous and unreasonable to say that all sins are the same. They're not the same. And you will see all throughout the Torah, not every sin was punished the same. God wasn't going to kill somebody for stealing something, no, you had to repay that person or pay, repay them double. Um, but he is going to require your life if you're sacrificing your child to, to anybody. But I just want to point that out because sometimes that is taught that, um, that all sins are the same and, um, they're not, they're not all the same and they were not, the, the, the repercussions for each sin were different. And, and those repercussions matched the, 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 the punishment fit the crime. Okay. The punishment fit the crime as well. It should, I mean, it's, there's no, there's no blanket punishments for, for all sins. So I just want to point that out. Um, But if the people of the land all hide their eyes from that person when he gives of his seed to Molech and do not put him to death, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off, along with all who play the prostitute after him with Molech from among their people. In other words, if you're, if you're watching this person sacrifice their child and you're hiding your eyes from them, uh, God's going to come against you too. Okay. The soul that turns to mediums or soothsayers, prostituting himself with them. I will set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Why does God say you're prostituting yourself with a medium or a soothsayer? Why does he use that verbiage? Because mediums and soothsayers are getting their information from false gods. They're getting their information from either fallen angels or demons, um, from your spirits. That's why he says prostituting yourselves with them because their source is not Yah. Okay. So if it's not Yah, then it's some other God. And that's why he uses that verbiage prostituting yourself because that's the verbiage that he uses when anybody worships other gods. So consecrate yourselves, yourselves and be holy for I am Yah your God. You're to keep my statues and do them. I am Yah who sanctifies you. Any man who curses his father or his mother should surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or mother and his blood should be on him. Um, when he says curses, you have to understand that in this time, there was actual curses that pagans used to put on people. 
okay? This was a form of witchcraft. You could actually perform a ritual that was going to bind and put a, a curse on somebody, okay? Th this, this verse is not just saying if you, if you say a cuss word to your mother or father, then you should be put to death. That is not what is being said here. But people will read this and because they don't understand the time and the culture, they would say, oh my gosh, God is putting them to death because they, they, they said a curse word to their mother or father. That's not what he's saying here. He's talking about somebody, remember, he's speaking to a people that are surrounded and have come out of a culture that is saturated in paganism, idolatry worship, child sacrifice, witchcraft, sorcery. This is the whole world. It's full of it. He's talking about not actually putting a curse a witch, of witchcraft on your father or your mother. Okay? Um... This, this was very serious back then. Somebody uh, performing some sort of a curse on somebody. It could be binding and it could affect their lives. <clears throat> exactly like today, yes. So punishments for sexual immorality. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, who commits adultery with his friend's wife, both the adulteral, adulterer and the adulteress should surely be put to death. Now, this was very serious. You did not, um, listen, um, covenantal relationships like marriage is very, very sacred to God. Very sacred to Yah. Okay. Marissa says, he really did write it on our hearts. It's all so common sense. Yes. Yes. Now these things are written in our hearts. This is what the new covenant, it, new covenant is out of Jeremiah. Again, churchianity doesn't even know what the new covenant is. They've never even, they don't even, they could, they've never even seen that verse in Jeremiah to know what the new covenant is. Unfortunately. Um... So when this says, so adultery, um, you, yes, you are to be put to death. But notice this here, okay? The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, who commits adultery with his friend's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress should be put to death. If you remember in the New Testament, when the Pharisees brought the adulteress to Yeshua, the question remains, what, so when they did that, they were actually sinning against the Torah. Because the Torah says to bring the adulterer and the adulteress, not just the adulteress. They brought the woman out to Yeshua and said, she's an adulteress. We call her sleeping with another man. And he says, he who is without sin cast the first stone because he caught them sinning because they didn't bring out both parties. They brought the woman. They didn't bring the man. They violated Torah. This is what... See, now people take that out of context. And they say, oh, a woman who's an adulteress shouldn't be punished. Um, see, Jesus, uh, Jesus said, and I'm saying Jesus because that's what they use. Jesus said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. They're already taking that out of context. It doesn't mean that you can't cast stones if you're, if you have sin. Although, you know, of course you, you shouldn't, but hold on one second. Bella! Bella, come! Sorry, my dog is barking. What he was saying was, how dare you bring this woman out without bringing the man also, which is required by Torah. Now you are sinning. You who is without sin cast the first stone. So he knew the Torah. How come they weren't following the Torah? <laughs> Leviticus 20 verse 10 clearly says both the adulterer and the adulteress should surely be put to death. 
But they only brought the woman. They didn't bring the man. So that text is already completely... Now people just completely take that out of context. They said, oh, he is who he, he who is without sin cast the first stone. That means if you point out somebody's sin, then they say, oh, because, you know, oh, he's he, another. They, they, they just use it when you're trying to point out someone else's sin is basically how people use it in the context today. They try to say, oh, well, he who is without sin cast the first stone, meaning you can't. You can't point out somebody's sin simply because... So they're misusing that that verse. Because when Yeshua said, He who is without sin cast the first stone, He didn't mean, oh, you know, um, you know, you guys are without sin, so you can't cast a stone at her. He's saying, where's, where's the man? You're going against Torah. You're, you're not following God's instructions on how, the situ on how to deal with this situation. Both the adulterer and the adulteress are supposed to be put to death. And you're just bringing the woman. Where's the man? If a man lies with his father's wife and has uncovered his father's nakedness, both of them should surely be put to death and their blood should be on them. Okay. You have just... You have just slept with your father's wife. Okay. Okay. That is a serious, serious sin. Um, both of them should be put to death. So the wife and the son are, are both going to be put to death. Um, again, adultery? Adultery is not... Is, adultery is not taken lightly in God's, in God's um, eyes. Um... A covenant is, he's a covenantal God. The marriage covenant is so serious and so sacred. Um, and it's supposed to be sort of this mirror of our relationship with Yahuwah. And um, for someone to step out of that marriage covenant um, was, was worthy of death. Um this is how serious it was. Today, we call it, oh, you, they cheated. Or we say they, uh, yeah, that's what we say today. We say, oh, they cheated on this person. Or they, um, you know, they slept with someone else. We, we use it so lightly today. Um, back then, and in, and in God's eyes, it's, it's, it's so much more than that. Um, I mean... It's unbelievable. We've just like lessened. Um, you, you see how society has. Has. Has made marriage so cheap. But now they're making. Uh, marrying of the same sex. Which is against God's laws. So. So sacred. It, it's. It's so upside down. Oh. It just break. It breaks my heart. I can only imagine. How it breaks God's heart. Okay, so... If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them should surely be put to death. They have committed a perversion and their blood should be on them. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They should surely be put to death. Their blood should be on them. Okay, again, it's, you know, not my opinion... You cannot sleep with the same sex. If a man takes a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They should be burned with fire, both he and they, so that there may be no wickedness among you. If a man lies with an animal, he should surely be put to death. And you are to kill the animal. You have defiled the animal. And more than likely, possibly impregnated it? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Um, if a woman approaches an animal and lies down with it, you are to kill the woman and the animal. They should surely be put to death and their blood should be on them. If a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and sees her nakedness, and she his, it is a shameful thing. 
They are to be cut off in the sight of the children of their people, for he has uncovered his sister's nakedness and will bear his iniquity. So you see here, this is just simply seeing your siblings naked. Okay, and this is not them as children. This is them as adults. Um, they're to be cut off in the sight of the children, in the sight of the children of their people. So they're they're not sleeping with each other. They're just they have they they're seeing each other naked. Um, so basically, they're to be cut off in the sight of the children of of their people, but they're not. But death is not the punishment. If a man lies with a woman during her nida, which is her period, her cycle, and exposes her nakedness, he has exposed her flow and she has uncovered the flow of her blood. Both of them are to be cut off from among their people. Again, it's not death. It's cut off from among their people. You are not to uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister or your father's sister. For the one who does that has made his close relative naked and will bear his iniquity. If a man lies with his aunt, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness and should bear their sin and die childless. If a man takes his brother's wife, it is impurity. It is an impurity. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness and they will be childless. You shall be holy. Now you are to keep all my statutes and all my ordinances and do them so that the land where I am bringing you to dwell will not vomit you out. You are not to walk in the ways of the nations which I am casting out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I abhor them. Okay, so he's telling you, I'm creating these laws because all the nations do these things. They practice these things. This is why God has to make these laws, because they are being practiced all over the earth at this point. But I have said to you, you will inherit their land and I will give it to you to possess it. A land flowing with milk and honey. And I am Yah your God who has set you apart from the peoples. Also, you are to make a distinction between the clean animal and the unclean. And between the unclean bird and the clean. And you are not to make your souls detestable by any animal or by a bird or by anything with which the ground teems, which I have set apart as unclean for you. In other words, you're not supposed to be eat any animals that I don't call food. Any animal that I consider unclean, you're not to eat. It's just that simple. You are to be holy to me, for I, Yah, am holy, and have set you apart from the peoples so that you will be mine. A man or woman who is a medium or a soothsayer should surely be put to death. They should stone them with rocks and their blood should be on them. It's, trust me, there, there's much more that goes into it other than you just thinking that this is a psychic, okay? These people are dealing with false gods, okay? They're dealing in witchcraft, okay? a very serious offense okay last chapter chapter 21 this is holiness and priests and Yah said to Moses speak to the Kohanim the priests the sons of Aaron and say to them a Kohen is not to allow himself to become unclean for the dead among his people except for his relatives that are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, or his brother, or his virgin sister who is near to him, who had no husband. For her, he may allow himself to become unclean. In other words, they're not allowed to touch a dead person unless it's close relatives who have died. But he is not to defile himself, a husband among his people, and so profane himself. Kohanim are not to shave their heads nor shave off the corners of their beards, nor to make any cuttings on their flesh. They are to be holy to their God and not profane, profane the name of their God. For they present the offerings of Yah made by fire, the bread of their God. They are, therefore, they are to be holy. 
They are not to marry women who are defiled as prostitutes or profane. Neither should they marry women divorced from their husbands, for a Kohen is holy to God. Therefore you are to sanctify him, because he offers the bread of your God. You should be holy, he should be holy to you, for I, Yah, who sanctifies you, am holy. The daughter of any Kohen, if she profanes herself by playing the prostitute, profanes her father, she is to be burned with fire. The office of Kohen was very serious. If there's a daughter who is playing the prostitute, and now she has basically, um, um, she's given her father a bad name. She has, um, she has brought, um, shame on the family and her father. Um, she's to be burned with fire. He who is the Kohen Hagadol, that's the high priest among his brothers, upon whose head the anointing oil is poured and is consecrated to put on the garments, is not to let the hair of his head hang loose or tear his clothes. Nor should he go near any dead person defiling himself, even for his father or mother. So you have the Kohen, the Kohanim, which are the priests. They're not allowed to touch any dead person except their close family. However, if you're the high priest, because remember, this is the one that's allowed to go into the Holy of Holies and to uh, make atonement for the children of Israel. They cannot even go and defile themselves near any dead person, even if it's their father or their mother. He is not to go out of the sanctuary or profane the sanctuary of his God, for the crown of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am Yah. He should take a wife in her virginity, a widow or one divorced or one who has been defiled as a prostitute. He is not to marry. He is to take a virgin from his own people as a wife. So as not to corrupt his offspring among his people, for I am Yah who sanctifies him. Yah spoke to Moses saying, Say to Aaron, None of your offspring throughout their generations who has a defect may approach to offer the food of his God. So if you have offspring um, and they have a defect, they can't, they can't um, participate in the... Um, in the... Um, Sacrificial ceremonies. Any man who has a defect is not to draw near. No one that is blind or lame or disfigured or deformed. Or a man who has a crippled foot or a crippled hand. Or a hunchback or a dwarf. Who ha or who has an eye defect or a rash or scabs. Or who has damaged testicles. None of the offspring of Aaron, the Cohen, who has a defect, should come near to present offerings of Yah made by fire. Since he has a defect, he is not to come near to offer the food of his God. He may eat the food of his God, both from the most holy and the holy, but he's not to approach the curtain or come near the altar because of the defect on him, so that he may not desecrate my sanctuary, for I am Yah who sanctifies them. So Moses spoke to Aaron and to his sons and to all of Israel. And that is the end of chapter 21. Um, there was so much in all of these chapters that we nearly have done this video for two hours. Thank you for sticking around. I'm pretty sure this gives you a lot of clarity regarding God's laws. These are not None of them. I haven't found one law that made me say, you know, that should be done. That should be done away with. Not one. Um, remember, um, and, and that last part, he's not, again, he's not, um, <laughs> God's not against people with a defect or, or, or a hunchback or blind or lame. However, the temple service was so, so strict in how it could be managed 
that person could not participate um, in the priestly duties, but God says that they could um, they could still partake of the food. So all the offerings that came that, you know, because that, that was the food for the priests. So they were able to eat those meals. They just weren't able to participate in the, um, in the ceremony in the sacrificial ceremony, even though they were of the priestly line, they were not able to participate in the sacrifices and the ceremonies. Um, and again, a lot of that has to do with defiling the temp, the, the, the tent of meeting, defiling the sanctuary, in which case they could die. So God, God is just protecting them and protecting the sanctuary. Okay. So I'm sure you got a lot out of this video. I'm pretty sure you did. And I really, 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 really hope that you will join me this Shabbat at 1130. We are going to do this part two of the Lord is my shepherd study. Um, it's going to be beautiful. Beautiful. And it's so interesting how some of this is going to tie in together. Um, when I say that um, it, it's going to it's going to expound on the linen. Okay, the fabric that the priests wore. Um you're going to want to be there this Shabbat for that video. Okay. Um, God bless you guys. I'm so glad I got to um, fellowship with you today. I'm glad we got to study this part of Leviticus. We're going to finish up Leviticus next week. God's willing. And um, I hope to see you then. Have a blessed and wonderful rest of your day. See you next time.